Hello and welcome to Krakow Stories Podcast, bringing you stories about life in Krakow from the people who live in Krakow. My guest today is Harry, Harry Parwani, who is joining us to tell us about his experiences running restaurants in Krakow, Katowice and Srintibia across Poland and Czech Republic. Especially he wants to tell us today about opening Krakow's first charity-run Ukrainian restaurant, Zwarte Serza. Harry, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to be here in Krakow? Tell us a wee bit first about your Krakow story, then we'll go on to talk in more detail about Zwarte Serza. Uh, sure, David. First of all, thank you for having me. I first visited Krakow about eight years ago. It was a holiday. I was visiting with a couple of friends. I thought, wow, this place is beautiful. The architecture, safety-wise, I saw a lot of potential and it wasn't planned for me to live in Krakow. It kind of stayed in my head. Yeah, all these years later, somehow my life brought me here. I opened a restaurant here in Krakow two and a half years ago, a vegan IF ramen in Krupnicza. Yeah, and recently after everything what happened with Ukraine, me and some of my people who work with me, we were involved in helping Ukraine through cooking, cooking meals and giving it out to refugees crossing the border. Eventually that continued helping in the refugee centers in Krakow. Yeah, finally the idea came to create something more sustainable to not just give something for free, but actually give people opportunity to learn something and cook. Also cook for people who can come and eat their food. Of course, it's not for free. <laughs> now they have to pay. <laughs> the money is going to the people who are working there and also for the costs of maintaining the uh, Zlota Sersa restaurant in Zabocha. And uh, that's a project that is dear to my heart. I'm trying my best to make it successful. The term successful for me in this case means break even. <laughs> so just they can cover all their costs and uh, be sustainable and be able to provide for themselves. And I think that's the mission, to give the people the tools so they can take care of themselves. Unlike your other successful ramen restaurants here in Krakow and in Katowice, coming soon to Warsaw and to Brno in the Czech Republic, your ramen restaurants are successful based on that experience. Another part of your story, which we'll come to in a minute, which I think is significant to this, you opened Zlota Sersa. Primarily, the Zlota Sersa restaurant is to give people work. And uh, these are refugee ladies who were also volunteering with me. Some of them I know for a, for a longer time, and they were volunteering with me when I was cooking for refugees in shelters. These are hardworking, kind, and good people. And to create this project, I would say that it did have that human factor because I knew these people and I wanted to help them. But my philosophy about giving is that sometimes when you give, even if you have good intentions, it can create a negative consequence. When you give something the first time, it's appreciated. Second time, it will be anticipated. Third time, it will be, yeah, people will create an expectation. Eventually, it could even create resentment toward you. It's like, oh, why this person is not giving me anymore? So therefore, it's better to give people the tools that they can take care of themselves than to continuously give them charity. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so one of the biggest factors on success of restaurants in 2023 are deliveries. And the delivery apps, they normally take up to 30% from restaurants for each delivery. Amazing part of a charity run a restaurant is we have partners which offer us 0%. They do it based on my reputation and they know me and they know my restaurant, so it's my connections. And I think that's important element to make uh, Zlota Sersa, let's say, break even on the long term. We have right now Glovo app, which you can order the food to home. 
and we are trying to get Uber and Bolt and Walt eventually. So I think that from this perspective, it should be a lot easier to make a restaurant, which is charity, to reach that break even. We had our challenges, unfortunately, due to timing, due to some other unexpected factors. But uh, yeah, the goal still remains. We are working hard to make it work. And I think that's the most important. I think it's important as well to mention that whilst it's a Ukrainian restaurant, serving Ukrainian food, buying Ukrainian people, it's not only for Ukrainians. I've been there a few times and the food's fantastic. You might want to talk about the food in a second. Where it's Ukrainian food, but it'll be very familiar to Polish people because a lot of the food is similar and quite the same with the Ukrainian twist, of course. So can you tell us a wee bit about the food? Yeah, I would say... So when it comes to the food, first of all, I don't eat meat, so I cannot eat most of the things, food there. But I have, and it was delicious. <laughs> but, uh, thank you. So most of the things that I eat, I think it's amazing. But the level of work and professionalism that the people are putting in their work, I think it's definitely admirable. And I've seen how people who eat there, how much they appreciate it. And I think that is definitely an indicator that they're doing a great job. When it comes to my personal feedback to them, it's very difficult because obviously I could say like, hey, let me improve this dish for you. But then it wouldn't be authentic Ukrainian. Sure. So this is why I try to stay out of the kitchen. I'm mostly coming in and saying like, okay, let's improve this process. You're spending, for example, four minutes to prepare this element of the work. Can we do it in one minute? Yep. If you, for example, use this equipment or this tool, or can we add an additional step to it? Can we, for example, purchase readier ingredients so i'm helping more from the side of let's say organizational part of the kitchen because this is something they don't have experience with they know how to cook they have been cooking for their families for you know many years i'm just trying to make it more working in a restaurant environment where they have to do it for many many more people than you know one so, family so you're behind the processes of procurement the business side of it the logistics and just making sure that it runs smoothly and i've been there and you might be the boss but definitely i know who the boss is in the kitchen <laughs> i'm no boss <laughs> Tell us a wee bit about the food. What can people expect to find at Zwarte Serps or when they come to Zwarte Serps? Yeah, so they have uh, dumplings, vareniki. It's Ukrainian dumplings, which they prepare in four different tastes. Besides that, the most popular dish is kurchak po Kievsku. It's like Kiev style of chicken. It's filet of chicken. They put spices and butter inside and roll it and then deep fry it. So when you cut it, you see all the, you know, butter and stuff inside. They have amazing shashliks. Shashliks are not traditional Ukrainian, but very popular. So I had a Komodo grill. It's a Japanese grill, which is amazing, like for shashliks, because in Japan, they're also making shashliks, but this specific grill. So they're using my Japanese grill which I donated to them to make amazing Ukrainian shashliks. And what's crazy about it is I have chefs in Katowice who use the same equipment and they were working with it for three years. These ladies in a couple of months make better shashliks than my chefs in Katowice. It's so bad that I had to tell them like, guys, go and learn from them because I don't know what they're doing, but they're definitely doing stuff doing better. better. Yeah. The food is multicultural anyway, but you know, you've got the Ukrainian ladies in Poland making shashlik from Far East, yeah. Middle East, but on a Japanese grill. Yes. This brings me to the international element. You didn't make mentioned their soup, their barst as well. Mm. They, they were making some bread, some... Pampushki, yeah. Pampushki. It's like garlic bread, yeah. handmade garlic bread. They make it fresh every day. And it goes amazing with soups, like specifically barsh. And they also have vegetarian option, which is like a mushroom soup, which I'm a big fan of. I can recommend the bread. It was delicious. And to rewind a bit, Harry, and come back a little bit about your story. I know that you arrived here in Krakow and you opened your restaurant. And the first thing you did when the war broke out is you took one of your food trucks and you were serving food at the border, collaborating with charities, doing an awful lot to help when the war had broken out. And you've kept that going. But can you tell us a wee bit about your own personal background, how you came to be in Europe via the Netherlands? 
Netherlands and tell us your story. Yeah, so when I was born in uh, 1986, this was when Russia was bombing Kabul, Afghanistan, and uh, me and my family, we fled to Pakistan, where I spent most of my years. You know, being a refugee in the, let's say, 90s, it's not exactly the same as right now like as a child i wasn't going to school i had to work take care of my family we collected enough money at one point to move to russia but it was supposed to be like a transit we were supposed to go to moscow and our uncle told us that he can help us bring us to europe so we arrived in moscow and he said like sorry but I can't do anything for you because something changed. We have to kind of take care of ourselves. So we were in Moscow in 90, I think it was 97. I was a young, young boy, uh, eight years old. At that point, we didn't have enough money to even afford to pay for a place to live. So we had to work and I had two younger brothers and my dad. My dad went to work at a place where deliveries were coming and he had to take out the, yeah, the delivery but it was like heavy things mm. the transport big transport trucks were coming he has to unload them so i tried to help but i was too young and let's say weak for that but i noticed that a lot of people were working there and there was no food so i went back home and i told my mom maybe you can cook something and i can try to sell it and actually that turned out to be an amazing idea because she cooked like some specific persian type of cakes very dry and we call it roth i took like three of these in my backpack and you cut them like in let's say eight pieces and I was selling them per piece so I sold them all like in 20 minutes and I went back home and my mom was surprised so she started cooking more and I was selling more and more of these I was the highest earner in my family for the time when we were in Russia remind us what age you were then I was eight years old. Eight year old entrepreneur. Yeah. yeah. So after this, we were able to collect enough money that my dad opened a, a shop. In this shop, we were selling clothes, like leather jacket. When my dad was in that shop, like people didn't buy. I don't know why. But when I was there, people would always buy because at that age, it wasn't like I was speaking Russian, but I guess I was speaking some because I could communicate with people. And I guess when the customers were coming, they thought I was cute and trustworthy because people were, I was selling coats for like two, three hundred dollars, you know, back then that was a lot of money because sure. this was like real leather. And in Moscow, it was really cold. People needed this kind of, and you know, this was like barely post Soviet. So there was not a lot of businesses selling stuff. At one point, my dad said, okay, you know what? It's better if I open a second shop where he can be, <laughs> he'll just leave me in one. So I was running this shop and I was selling a lot of coats. And after about a year in Moscow, uh, we saved up enough money to move to Europe. Yeah, like, yeah, that was... Where did you move to? You went to the... So first we came to Germany. Oh, okay. uh, we were there for a while. And then the person said to us, it's better to go to Netherlands. For families, it's better to be there. And that was where my life kind of begun, you know, normal life, like school, mm -hmm. You know, regular stuff. By then, my brain was already ruined, I think, because everything was boring for me. Yeah. <laughs> so most people go from schoolboy to, to working to entrepreneur. You did it the other way around. You went from working <laughs> to entrepreneur to school. Yeah, I was always bored at school because I didn't understand why I shouldn't just work. And I always had work. I always had some extra jobs and I always tried to earn money. But it was important for my parents that I go to university they said like if I graduate university I can do what I want yeah and in the period when I was going to university I wasn't really going to classes but I had really good contact with all the teachers and I was honest with them and I told them I'm working a lot so I'll come when it's needed you know and most of them were really okay with that we had to buy books I thought buying books was waste of time so I would borrow books and copy them I was copying so many books at one point and I there was a charity shop which was run by by handicapped people. This was, you know, like in 2000s. Back then, there was not like these rules that you can't copy books and stuff. <laughs> I had a deal with them that I would, they would copy me books and I would go around and at one point in the school, no one had real books anymore because they were expensive, you know. You could get a copy book for one third of the price. So I was doing the, you know, everyone was calling me like, hey, can you <laughs> copy some books for us too? So, so everyone had the Harry Parwani 
edition of their textbooks, their school books. Yeah, and and we were supporting a really nice, uh, you know, yeah. initiative back then. It's so. a win-win. Exactly. Just to recap, so it was from Afghanistan to Pakistan to Russia to Germany to the Netherlands. You graduated university, and then yeah. how did they? So uh, for my university, I did like international business. I had to do like one year of work abroad. I found this amazing opportunity together with a friend. He was Suriname. He's half like Indian, half black. Looks quite exotic guy. So the two of us, we went to Suzhou in China for a year. <laughs> we were working there for a Chinese company. It was uh, China Precision Technologies and it was amazing. Suzhou had maybe 20 foreigners, you know. It was especially for my friend. He was seen as a movie star back then. We were going to parties everywhere we went. He was treated like VIP. So you know? you're celebrities in this town. <laughs> yeah, because he was so, you know, they don't get too much black people there. And we had really amazing experience in China and also work-wise, we learned a lot. So this company, it was quite a big company. And so they took us like as let's say interns our job was to entertain their big clients so they had these big clients you know from uh, japan korea who are coming and we are supposed to take them to dinners lunches and entertain them that was our let's say work and besides that i don't know we were doing some other stuff as well so it was quite a nice experience i had a lot of fun after i graduated i did some traveling i was living also in brazil for a while and then I was always doing some creative things. Like, for example, I had my own Bitcoin mining farm. <laughs> that was that was long time ago, before Bitcoin blew up, you know. I'm not surprised to hear that. My parents told me that, listen, give up because this money that doesn't fall from the sky. And I told them, like... Let's just wait with this because I think this Bitcoin thing is going to blow up, you know. They're like, no, 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 come on, stop wasting time, find some normal job. So eventually I sold this farm. I still had some Bitcoin, but like literally one year afterward, Bitcoin blew up in 2016, 17. But unfortunate timing. Back then I decided to try to get a food truck. So me and a friend, we built a food truck. Uh, it was a churros truck. We were doing some events with it in Netherlands. It was not that interesting. So I made a proposal, let's try some different countries because it's Europe, but we can go anywhere. So I took this food truck and I went to Germany, I went to Denmark, I went to Czech Republic, Slovakia and Poland. In Poland, there was this huge hype for food trucks back in 2015-16. I was making churros, so very, let's say, easy food. I made a bunch of friends in Katowice, Krakow, all food truckers. So they told me like, hey, just stay here for a season, you know, try to work here. So I did. Before I knew it, I remember like there were so many times when I was almost broke, you know, I was like last, I don't know, 10 zloty in my pocket, about to call mom and dad for rescue, you know. I'm too proud to ask. So if, if, if I would call, it would be like, yeah, send me money because I'm gonna drive back, you know? I remember that the food truck was broken and I needed to repair it, but I was repairing it just enough to get from, you know, one event to the next. I was sleeping in the food truck. I was, you know, like eating almost nothing. There was this, uh, it was 2016, the Pope came to Poland. So he came to Krakow and I was able to get a place next to the American and Australian, let's say, dormitories with the churros. This event, I barely made it there and I gave all my money to be there and it was amazing. Like, we were selling six, seven, eight thousand zloty per day in churros, which at that time it was a lot more money money than now. You know, now it's also a lot of yeah, money, yeah. but back then. So it gave you some financial security and allowed you to stay in Poland. Yeah, after uh, I always say like uh, Pope saved saved <laughs> me. You know, Pope came to save me. Yeah. I invested that money, repaired the food truck, improved the visualization, worked further. Yeah, like from there on, I was taking some more risks. I made a second food truck, a third food truck. That business kind of grew. Eventually, I had to make a decision to maybe try to open a restaurant in Poland, which I did. Turned out to be a good decision. Then 
COVID came, turned out to be a bad decision. <laughs> you know how that goes. Yeah, it's been up and down, but mostly up, I would say. Recently, the company was able to acquire property near Katowice. It's fully built as a storage and a production facility. So that's the place where we produce for all the ramen restaurants. We just deliver to each restaurant. We don't have, let's say, quote unquote, chefs in the restaurants because the chefs are in the production. They produce, they prepare. In the restaurants, they are just more like assembling. This is the so model. You an absolutely wonderful background and story. Let's come back to the present day. Where are we now? You've got Zwarte Serza as your charity-based community Ukrainian restaurant. What restaurants do you have just now? And then we'll move on to talk about what's coming next. My first restaurant was Omay Ramen in Katowice. Then I opened the Vegan IF in Krakow. Idea was to stick mostly with vegan restaurants because I don't eat meat. Then we did the Vegan Ramen in Katowice. And recently it was more, uh, let's say, ambition of some of the guys who work with me for a long time. They wanted to prove themselves. They have this idea that they want to make better ramen. So they need a bigger kitchen and a nicer place. So this is why we opened the Omai Ramen 2, which has completely different menu. And my goal is to not open any more restaurants. I'm really okay at this stage. I want to share my knowledge and know-how. So this is why I'm focused more on franchising, helping people, business consulting in terms of, you know, kitchen, menu, everything. If they want to use my knowledge and resources to create similar concepts in Poland or other country. So this is why we are doing the franchise of Vegan IF and Brno, which I'm very excited about. And we are in the talks about Omai Ramen in uh, Warsaw. Besides this, I've also helped some other restaurants. For example, the Mustachio restaurant, which is doing amazing in Krakow. Thibaut, who's the owner, had a lot of meetings with him and we worked together and we also, you know, helped with that. And I guess that was the first time where I found my confidence that maybe yeah. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> You know, I think that there's plenty of opportunity for everyone. I know that business in Poland is really difficult. People underestimate the challenges in gastronomy, especially from the business side. For example, when it comes to opening a company, what kind of tax form is beneficial? What is best to way to hire people, build up, you know, those important decisions, which will usually show in a longer period of time. If you make those mistakes later, it's very difficult to change them because you'll be stuck with something. And usually it's really important to advise a person who's doing business because people think that they get this advice from an accountant. I will be really honest with you. Accountants will advise you business model which benefits them because they will advise you a model where you have to collect a lot of invoices, which brings them more work. And this will be, you know, they can charge you more money. Whereas there's other models where you don't really need invoices. For example, in Poland, you have reach out. Reach out is a fixed tax rate from your overall income. A lot of invoices, which has 0% VAT, you can just throw them away. Because giving them to the accountant, he will charge you for nothing. Therefore, no one advises you this model, which is amazing for the food industry, especially for new companies. So, yeah, those are one of the things. And the reach out has also a lot of different elements. You've given an idea for a future podcast because I happen to know that in our international community here in Krakow, there are a lot of foreigners who are involved in gastronomy or they want to get involved. And as you said, there's a lot of pitfalls. We all know how many restaurants and businesses have opened and closed. In. So I think we should come back to perhaps doing a, a wee mini guide to gastronomy and how to, people can get started. And we have to be careful that we're not verging on to your business as a, a consultant. Oh, I'm really happy to share this info. I think this information everyone should know. Yeah. I'm surprised when I talk with people who are in the business and I'm asking them these questions and they tell me that they don't know. They just trust their accountant to make all decisions, which is terrifying to hear. <laughs> so we've done your past, we've done your present. I'd like to recap with a bit more about Zwarte Serza. 
as well, you mentioned food trucks. Uh, apart from the restaurants that you've mentioned, you, you also have your food trucks. You do food at events on the market square, festivals, uh, not just in Krakow, but across Poland. They'll find you as what well. you're doing churros. Yeah, so things. for me, that's my passion. That's what I started with, the food trucks. And my dream was to always have the most amazing food truck ever, which I was able to build exactly in 2022. It was made to be able to serve 2,000 uh, ramens per day. You know, that's how I constructed it. Like the amount of space for fridges, freezers, the setup, all the equipment, it's made for, you know, mass events. So it's a mega food truck. Exactly. It was ready one week before the war broke out. We were trying to make this food truck. The events are starting in the summer, so we were ready a bit earlier. We thought, hey, let's test it out. Let's see if we can feed a lot of people with this. I don't know, like this timing, I think it's a little bit of a miracle because I remember when we came to the border, there was no one there. You know, for the first couple of days, these people were waiting for days at the border without food, without barely any drinks. And it was cold. It was minus five, minus 10 degrees. And they just crossed the border, come to us, and we were waiting for them with some tea, coffee, and a hot sandwich. And they loved it. Let's finish by, again, explaining to people how Zwarte Serpsa works. Tell us how people can support you, how they can make sure that Zwarte Serpsa grows and continues to give this support. First way, of course, is to just go there, eat, try the food, and if you like it, you know, feel free to go again. Uh, you can order on Glovo. Glovo is an amazing partner. They uh, offer us 0% commission. Normally, it's a lot more for normal restaurants is up to 30%. We are working also with Uber. We hope in the next two weeks to launch that so you can order on Uber. The idea is also to add Bolt and Volt eventually. Second way is you can gift a meal, for example, for 24 Zlotis. You support one meal for a refugee. What this means is we create a voucher. We hand it to a refugee shelter, to people who need it. Those people, they don't just get a meal. They can come and they get a nice service. They can sit down in this cozy Ukrainian environment. They get that feeling of being human, of being home, to not just be a refugee, to not just, you know, get stuff just thrown at you. I mean, you know, when you're getting food or stuff, but you can actually get an experience. And I think it's important to do that as well. We are doing about 200 vouchers, but it depends on how much donations we get. And from this 24 Zlotis, about half of it goes to the salaries of the ladies who prepare the food. The other half goes to the ingredients, what we are using. Some of this money, you know, goes to rent, media, as stuff. Right now, the restaurant does somewhere between 35, 40,000 zloty per month. The salaries come up to 25,000. All the costs together come up to 60,000. So our goal is to reach that 60,000 so they'll be sustainable. And for now, of course, I'm helping. I'm trying to give them whatever they need. Eventually, the goal is that they can take care of themselves and they will not be dependent on me or other people who are donating yeah. money. Come on, folks. It's great food. It's for a great cause. You can either go along and you know, enjoy a meal yourself. You can donate on a one-to-one -one basis to buy vouchers for a meal. But we also talked off here, you want to try and develop some partnerships with corporations and businesses or organisations who might want to support on a slightly bigger scale Scale and in lieu of that support, you're happy to give them some type of catering or some kind of barter. To yeah, so we will have to create an easy way because it can be difficult, right? It has to be an easy way to set up some website where people can, for example, order some kind of catering maybe once a week, once a month for their office instead of daily sandwiches and fruit, maybe skip a day and have a nice Borsch with Pampushka, you know, from Zlota Sersa, so, so, some stuff like this, some smaller things to increase the overall 
funds which can be used for the restaurant. But yeah, the goal is to create some kind of framework for that, some way that people can do it and they know how to do it and that we can make it happen. Yeah, these are things that we'll be working on in the next two months. Scaling it up, of course, which is always good in business, but as well to involve corporations, organizations, businesses, not only to supply them with catering to their business, but to try to invite them to yeah. give you some support, some financial support to keep the restaurant going and to support the ladies and their families, uh, their extended families who are all dependent on the success of Zwarte Serpster. So just to conclude, let's tell people how to find you, where your restaurant is uh, at yeah. and where they can find you online and just briefly about the, the Fundatia, people do want to get involved more. Zlota Sarsa restaurant is located in Zabocha 25 in Krakow. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram under the same name. And the charity is Gift a Meal Charity. It's a charity registered in Poland. If you want to see the menu for Zlota Sarsa, it's on their Facebook or you can go to Krakow Expats directory. We have a listing there for Zota Serpsa which includes their menu and information on how to get food and a little bit of the backstory about how Zota Serpsa came to be. As Harry mentioned, the restaurants in Zabocce, if you're not sure where Zabocce 25 is, you might have seen as you pass through the big Liberator aeroplane mural on the side of the building opposite the university, the Economics University? Yes, it's in the same so street. It's in this part of Zabwatchi. Please go along. The ladies are lovely. The decoration of the restaurant is all been done by the girls who are there. And in the corner they have yeah, handmade. handmade crafts and gifts for sale. Anything yeah. else you would like to add, Harry? It would be amazing and a dream come true to make a difference in these people's lives. They're hardworking uh, individuals, they have families, they have children. Some of them are planning to stay in Poland for a longer time. Some of them plan to go back to Ukraine when the war ends. Each of them is different, but each of them is a hard worker, kind, a good person. Yeah, I truly hope that this project can bring them happiness, bring them possibility to have a good life here in Poland, even if it's for just this period or for a longer time. And I hope uh, we can all make that happen. Harry, thank you very much. I'm fortunate I've been involved in your project, helping out, not absolutely not involved in making it happen. I've been along, I've met the ladies, I've tasted your food. I think it's absolutely fantastic what you're doing. The whole concept of not just being a case of handouts, but actually actively helping and supporting, looking at the longer term, not just the short term. As well, Harry, we shouldn't forget about, you know, we've talked a lot about Zota Serza. If you enjoy ramen, and who doesn't, we'll head along to Vegan AF Ramen on Krupnitsa. Go along and enjoy some delicious vegan ramen. Good luck, Harry, with not just Zota Serza and your ramen restaurants, with your new project you're franchising down in Brno and up in Warsaw. Please, people, if you're listening to this and you would like to go along and support Zota Serza, meet the wonderful ladies who are there, or if you are happy to support financially get in touch with Harry I'll include his contact details Harry before we finish uh, just do want to give a shout out to your team down at Zwarte Serpsa who have been part of this from the beginning ladies who are making it happen down in the kitchen yeah uh, sure like Julia Natalia uh, Victoria uh, second Natalia and third Natalia <laughs> <laughs> Nastia, of course, Anastasia. Anastasia is the one who's also taking care of the Facebook and Instagram, and she's doing an amazing job. Yeah, I'm proud of all of them for the hard work, yeah, facing all of these uh, challenges. Thank you, Harry. Uh, thanks very much for your time. Thanks for what you're doing. Let's look forward to having another chat about our mini gastronomy guide in the future. Yeah, sounds good. This has been Krakow Stories Podcast, sharing your Krakow stories. Thank you for listening.